devilish, inscrutable, adorable. We can't live with them or without them. The truth is, they're not dogs. Often we have no idea why they do the weird things they do. Cats do a lot of strange and amusing things. I think they just want to have fun. Could it be that our adorable house guests are really predators in pets' clothing? It has those claws to get hold of prey. Want to know what's going on in Kitty's mind? Watch and learn. Our home, our rules, not exactly. Sometimes it seems the cat's in charge. As though they know us a lot better than we know them. clearly march to the beat of a different drummer, but that doesn't mean they're wicked. There is no such thing as a bad cat. Though sometimes it sure seems that way. All the behaviors that cats are exhibiting in the home, it's because of the environment that we put them in. Climbing the blinds or clawing the furniture. Clawing behavior is a natural behavior that cats exhibit out in the wild. It's to mark territory, it's to de-stress, to sharpen their claws. In nature, a cat has to guard its turf against all intruders. You've got all this expensive furniture. A cat's not for you. You know, uh, cats naturally scratch. They have scent glands in their feet. It's like Kev was here, you know? And so they're leaving their calling card. They're like chemical billboards. They like to roll in things. They like to have all that smell on me, you know? I was here. Maybe that's how it works in the jungle. But domestic cats aren't in the jungle. But their DNA doesn't know that. There's still something wild and natural right on your couch. You know, something that you live with. That, that is still a hunter. That's still, you know, it's still the, the call of the wild. It's this wild side that sometimes makes our furry friends hard to live with. Lily is a cat with attitude, attacking friends and strangers alike. Cat behaviorist Michelle Nagelschneider is here to help. Good girl. Good girl. So pretty. Now she's a little bit worried. It's okay. See that lip lick that she's worried, and see now her tail's going. Yeah, it's a little bit past her comfort zone. To a trained eye, Lily's restless tail has a tale to tell. Lily's ancestors used their tails to issue warnings. I'm this close to exploding. Wait. It's okay. It's okay. Just go really slow. It's okay, Lily. Just hold still. It's okay. I mean, her fear buttons push. She is redirecting aggression onto you, trying to lash out at you, invite you. Um, and so she's trying to go to safety. This is a survival instinct. She's not a bad cat. I mean, for a reactive cat that's not been socialized well when they were young, this is totally normal. And there are a lot of cats like this. They're just reactive. They're more worried in their environment. Um, this is more like your typical wild cat. A few of the signs that cats give us when it's time to stop petting them, they can hiss. Their whiskers will fan forward, you know, getting ready to bite. Uh, some cats will tense up. Those are all great signs that you've been petting your cat too long. What happens if you stop petting her? Like, just kind of... That growling is a warning. That's a vocalization for uh, other cats. Um, to know? Yeah, to say, leave me alone. 
So if you stop petting her, she might stop doing that. You should stop. Oh. Okay. No, Are you okay? Oh, there she goes. Once their fear button is pushed, you're not always going to have luck getting them to calm down. Cats can't use human language, so if we want to understand what's going on in their heads, we have to learn to read the signals. No. Come on. Hey! Case in point, the cat's proverbial curiosity. They never seem to tire of poking around. What are you doing, me? Someone needs to let the cat out of the bag. Oh, no. Sometimes they get themselves into hot water. And sometimes into cold water, which seems out of character for an animal known to hate getting wet. Some cats are attracted to water, especially if it's coming out of a fountain or a faucet. The way that it shimmers and wiggles, they know fresh water. It's instinctual. They're going to find that fresh water source. And what many cat owners don't know is that cats prefer to drink water away from their dead prey, you know, like out in the wild. Inside the home, their store-bought food is their dead prey. This could be contaminating their water source with bacteria. In the wild, cats have to investigate their surroundings to see what is there. Food, other cats, or enemies. Though since domestic cats have plenty to eat, sometimes traditional food items fall off the menu. Not all cat behavior is instinctive. Some, such as dogs are the enemy, they have to learn from mom. Take a kitten away from its mother too soon, and this is what you get. Izzy is an experienced mom, a Siberian. She's just given birth to her third litter. Not long after her kittens are born, Izzy does something a little unsettling, to us anyway. She eats the placenta. Why? When domestic cats give birth in the home, they will still eat the placenta just like a wild cat. And this is a survival instinct. The scent of the placenta would draw a predator to come in and eat the kittens. In the wild, without their mother, these babies would be toast. Cats are blind and helpless for the first three weeks, so the kittens depend on her for safety. Izzy instinctively knows to keep her babies together. And it's not just so it's easier to watch them. Newborns can't regulate their own body temperature. So in the wild, they'd be vulnerable to exposure. But there's warmth in numbers. Five weeks later, the sleepy balls of fluff have become the playful kittens we know and love. But this playful rough and tumble has a serious purpose. When kittens are young, their job is to sharpen their hunting skills. And there's all these motor pattern sequences that they need to practice to be these great hunters later on in life. So there's the stalk and chase, the grab and bite, the pounce and bite, the kill bite. And they need to practice these over and over and over again. Just like lions, tigers, and leopards, domestic cats are carnivores. They may get most of their flesh out of a can these days, but they share the same tools that have put their wild cousins at the top of the food chain. You've got an animal that has the archetypal carnivore set. It has those claws to get hold of prey. It 
has those fangs to go into the neck of it. They're extremely efficient hunters. In the US alone, scientists estimate the death toll is hundreds of millions of birds and over a billion small mammals every year. And when they can't actually go hunting, they still go through the motions. When a cat's sitting in the window and it sees a bird outside and it can't get to it, that chattering sound that we hear is an exaggerated kill bite response. To the cat, that bird is already in its mouth and they can taste it. And so it's just automatically, it's, you know, starting to bite. Domesticated cats may no longer need to hunt for survival, but their love of the chase hasn't gone away. Their prey drive is their biggest ingrained instinct that a cat has. So we can have an outside cat in the middle of eating a bird, and then there's four other birds flying around. It's gonna stop what it's doing a lot of the times and go kill all those four birds and then go back to eating that first one. Some cats will try and catch anything that moves. Insects, chipmunks, even inanimate objects. But the end of the chase isn't oh, always right the end of the story. Oh, oh Sparky, honey, you playing with the dead mouse. Oh. Sparky, Sparky, mousy killer. Oh. Cats <laughs> play with their food. It's a cat and mouse game, oh, you might say. You're such a good girl. Except it's not a game. Even for a formidable hunter, hunting is always risky. The prey could get in a lucky bite or sting before it finally dies. So often a cat will toy with its prey in order to exhaust it, and only after it's completely helpless, go in for the kill. Much safer that way. In the United States, two thirds of all domestic cats never leave the house. But if they can get past the front door, we'll travel great distances. In England, one group of cats is under close surveillance. We want to know where they go when they're given their freedom and what they do when they get there. Maybe this will shed some light on why cats do the things they do when they're at home. GPS transmitters will track their every step. You can go now. Cameras mounted on their collars will give us a cat's eye view of their lives out in the big city. While strategically placed night vision cameras will show us a side of cats they don't normally let us see. Our first contestants are the not very bright Bootsy and his wily sister, Jinxie. The kitty door has been in place for a while, and heading out on patrol is second nature to Jinxie. Bootsy, not so much. At night, the call of the wild is irresistible. Like their wild cousins, they're hardwired to be nocturnal hunters. They may not even be hungry. It's just what they do. They wander late into the night, even though potential danger is never far away. Prowling seems to come so naturally to cats, it's puzzling why they gave up their freedom to live with us in the first place. Let's take a little trip into house cat history. All cats share distinctive DNA. It allows us to map their evolutionary path.
So the ancestor of the domestic cat can be identified by using genetic markers. We had to find DNA samples from cats from all over the world, and so we've gone to the Middle East and Asia and Africa, and then we genetically type them. The research points to one cat species as the common ancestor of all domestic cats, Felis sylvestris libica, the African wild cat. Looks familiar? That's because around 10,000 years ago, it happened to be the right cat in the right place at the right time. We think the domestic cat came from wild cats that were in the Near East, so in the area that we would consider the Fertile Crescent, which is Iraq and Turkey and Syria. And um, we think they domesticated there because that's when humans first became farmers. As we became farmers, we stored grain, in came mice, in came cats for a nice free meal. From there, it was just one small leap into the lap of some benevolent human. The domestication of the cat is quite different from most of our other domesticated species. They really kind of domesticated themselves. They kind of snuck in our back door, where I think really cats have probably trained us to be their caretakers. No other species has made this jump from solitary hunter to human companion. It's a testament to their adaptability. An animal that is really a hunter, but he's prepared to be a scavenger, and they're also tolerant of us being around, and they're also tolerant of our habitat and all the noise that goes with it. That's the package. Put those three things together. They're successful. In short, they seem to actually like being around us. I think that it's underestimated how social cats are with each other. And so something about their psyche and something about our psyche has meshed. And that's where the bond comes from. Gentle. So now we know why wild cats gradually warmed up to people. And we know how they adapted to an environment and a role very different from what they were used to in nature. But what we get out of the relationship and why we're so drawn to them, that's another story. Palm Springs, California. A regional cat show is in full swing. This is CFA's largest breed. This is a Maine Coon. They have little tails. Over 200 pampered pets show off for their adoring fans. Stupid, but handsome. <laughs> Number three is the Seal Lynx Point. But just because all the people here are cat lovers doesn't mean they all love them for the same reason. You can sort of see the stripes on the tail and the stripes like on his face there's an M and little stripes. Some are intrigued by cat's close relationship to some very dangerous characters. When you look at tigers and you look at lions and then you look at the household cats and they all, you know, you know that they are all similar. That to me is very impressive that they're related to these magical wild cats. This is a breed that comes in long hair and short hair. This is the long hair. Some go for the cats that aren't quite what they seem to be. My favorite breed is the Maine Coon. I really like them because they're kind of like a dog. I like to say they're a, a, a dog in a cat suit. There must be a zipper in here somewhere. Where is it? Others love them not for their bodies, but for their minds. I was never allowed to have a cat growing up. I had a dog, I had a turtle, but my, my parents did not like cats. And I just got them by accident and I fell in love with the intelligence. Today, he is my second best long hair champion. And then of course, there's the cat's undeniable sensuality. They sleep with you, they always wanna be with you, and they make you feel good. They're very people-oriented. I walk in the room and sit on the sofa. Right away, they're on me. 
We spend a lot of time and money looking after our kitties, and sometimes they pay us back in surprising ways. Milo. Milo lives with his sister Meg, a third cat, Molly, and his owners, Karen and Bill. As you can see, he's a very, very handsome boy, but of course I'm quite biased about that. He's all muscle, but he is a love machine. Milo is such a love machine that he showers gifts on his family. It's one really distinctive, unusual habit is to bring home treasure, and his treasure is a long leaf from a cordyline plant. And he's very, very vocal about it when he does it too. In fact, lots of cats bring home gifts for their owners. Whoa, isn't that a big snake? Isn't that enormous? <gasps> but it may just be human vanity to see this as love. Very simply, there's no magical thing about it. This cat is bringing you a rat. What is he trying to do? He's bringing food back to the nest area. He's trying to make sure that you survive. And then we look out in nature. What do cats do out in the wild? They bring food back to the nest area. Some 10,000 years after coming in from the wild, cats still have to learn how to be our live-in friends. And they have to learn early. If they don't bond with us as young kittens, they probably never will. Socialization in kittenhood between the age of two and seven weeks is actually very critical. If they're not handled enough, they're not picked up 10 times a day, these are the cats that develop behavior issues. These are the cats that end up in the cat shelters. They just haven't been socialized well when they were kittens. He's calling his mommy now. Can you hear him? Oh. But if early bonding is the key to a mutually satisfying relationship between human and feline, that doesn't necessarily mean they love us for who we really are. It's actually another relationship altogether that drives the behavior we think of as affection. Why is it sitting on your lap? It's behaving as a kitten. The only time in its life it would normally get that much heat up from another animal is when it's with mum. And it's sitting there as a little kitten and it can feel the heat radiating out. Then there's making biscuits, which mystifies many cat owners. It too is a throwback to life with mother. Every time a cat does this onto you, it's behaving towards you as if you're mum. So you are seeing in that sort of behavior, this movement that comes in with suckling and the paws trying to stimulate milk flow. But what about petting? They seem to love it. Cat moms definitely can't do this. In our terms, we're stroking it. In a cat's terms, what's going on? It's actually the mother cat's tongue because the ratio between our hand and it as an adult cat is the same as mother cat's tongue. And purring, that's got to be love, right? Purring gives us such insight into the cat. It's an unbelievably peculiar thing. Purr is specifically for kittens. It just is a spin-off that it happens in adult life. They've got to be able to make a sound to mum, and she's got to be able to make a sound to them. And it's a sound that's not heard by anybody else. So the big, bad, nasty things that are out there, they're going to take advantage of her. Her is the best thing in the world to keep kittens and mum together quietly. The way we respond to a cat is all about bringing out that kitten in the cat. So we're trying to infantize the cat. House cats are very vocal, especially with their human owners. They use 23 different kinds of purrs, growls, hisses and meows to talk to us. Vocalization is reserved for people more so than for cat to cat. Cats have actually developed a meow just for humans. Sounds a little bit like wow. A little bit of a gurgle meow, and it definitely elicits a response from us humans. Wow. They've also adapted to the relative noisiness of the human world. They recognize that we are a much more vocal animal than they are. When they come to live with us, they realize if you want to be heard, 
you have to shout. So one of the commonest things they do is they turn up the volume on the meow and they will let you know that they want attention. I want my food. Meow, meow, meow. And if the meow doesn't work, they'll find their own way of getting through to us. When I was little, I, I used to look at my dogs and I'd say, gee, I wish I, I could, I wish you could talk to me. I wish I could understand what you're thinking. And the Siamese, you do understand what they're thinking. Samuel. Why? What's the matter? We've sort of got a bit of mutual communication going on. When one cat approaches another cat, the first thing that they will do to say, hi, yes, I might come a bit further forward, is to put a tail up. We instinctively do the same thing. What we do is when we go to greet a cat, we just put our arm down to say hi. But from a cat's point of view, it's seeing a vertical in the same way that we, they would normally see a vertical. So even at silly little levels like that, without realizing it, we're playing some of the cat recognition games. Learning to read a cat's body language is important, sometimes very important. I know her behaviors, I know her signals, I know you watch for eye movement, ear movement, tail twitching, everything. Lexi was a product of the pet market. Young man got her, thought it'd be really cool to have a pet tiger, and uh, so he took her home. He also had her declawed, thinking he'd be safer with a declawed tiger. Unfortunately, when these guys start hitting juvenile age, that's when they start getting a little bit rambunctious. And so he really started just kind of getting nervous and decided that he didn't want the tiger anymore. And so we took in Lexi. Terry Werner looks after rescued big cats, lions, cougars, bobcats, and leopards. You know, domestic cats and wild cats are very similar in their behavior. I often tell people, if you have a domestic cat at home, you basically have a small tiger. The stakes might be a little higher with a 270 kilogram tiger, but the basic principles are the same. They love to play with balls and cardboard boxes and stuff like that. Now, your domestic cat gets in there and plays with things, scratches on things. These guys destroy things. <laughs> Stalking, you'll see them stalking each other, stalking birds, so stalking prey. If your domestic cat bites you, yeah, it hurts. You're gonna have a cut on you and have to maybe get a couple stitches. These guys bite you, you may lose a hands, you may lose your life. So maybe when we try to figure out what our precious pets are doing, the trick is to just close our eyes and pretend they're taking a walk on the wild side. <laughs> Roger Tabor wants to know just how yes. far they do walk when they're out of sight. Come on, scoot. Scoot, scoot, scoot. And the results are in. So we've got Patch here. Patch is an old lady, 13 years old. But that doesn't mean she's a stay-at-home. Her owners have no idea what her secret life is like. She might be like the Aristocats and being a little jazz band, you never know. What she's doing is being an absolute classic female cat. If you're a classic female cat, what you do is you have your garden and a little bit of the neighbors because most cats like to use the neighbor's gardens as a latrine rather than their own. In the wild, marking, patrolling, and defending territory is crucial to an animal's survival. It can be about protecting the food supply, mates, or offspring. It's hard to believe all this would be important to the well-fed and well-housed domestic cat. But it is, or at least that's what Patch's genes tell her. Patch's territory covers a small area of gardens on either side of her street, meaning she rarely ventures further than 90 meters from her back door. Spraying, scratching, and rubbing are all about telling the competition, 
This is my turf. Roger's GPS analysis shows how all the collared house cats have carved up the neighborhood into territories, each centered around their own home. But little do his owners know that leaf thief Milo is the Alexander the Great of domestic cats. Be prepared, be very prepared. <laughs> Milo is taking over the world. <laughs> Milo is a long-distance traveler. His territory takes in 40 gardens and crosses several main roads. It's 20 times the size of Old Lady Patches. We've got Milo doing a huge range, and I mean, this is a big range by any um, domestic cat standards. It's because he's under stress. Not psychological stress, population stress. What you see is the reaction to cat density. He's relieving it just by having a larger range. I want yes. to be alone. Yes. I want to be alone, yes, absolutely. There is that <laughs> element of, I've yes. just got to get away from this for a while. And if other cats don't get the message, Milo's more than willing to explain it to them. The cat cam shows us a classic showdown from his point of view. male cats will mate with as many females as they can. Our domesticated cats have the same agenda, and that's another reason they protect their territory from unwanted intruders. But no matter how large a house cat's kingdom may be, its castle is, of course, the human home. So they have to keep intruders out. <coughs> Near San Francisco, <laughs> Megan lives in an apartment with her three cats. The two young males are in an almost constant state of war. They're like teenage boys, always jockeying for position and trying to show the other who's the boss. Megan's apartment is small, so it's hard to stay out of each other's face. Inside the home, the environment is usually set up in a way that's conducive to the owner's happiness and not the cat's. So when the cats have conflict, uh, time sharing a water area, a food area, latrine site, that's where we get territorial thinking begin to surface and that hostility between them. Edit! That's enough! You may have noticed that cats seem to be obsessed with getting to the highest spot of any room they're in. When a cat is up high, higher than the other cats, they're in a more assertive position. They can jump and attack onto another cat. They can see a bigger expanse of the territory. And all of those things would lend to, I'm the more dominant cat, you know, I'm going to be able to look down on the subordinates. It's just like human warfare. Both sides want to control the higher ground. And what applies to the average house cat is just as true for its homeless counterpart. Rome, Italy is famous for its feral cats, an estimated 300,000 of them. One colony has taken refuge in the city's ancient monuments. There are lots of coveted wall tops here, coveted and contested. Feral cats are a unique mix, neither truly wild nor house pet. They survive on the edge of human society. Whatever compromises wild cats made around 10,000 years ago to get along with us, these animals no longer make. It doesn't take long for a cat to adjust to life on the streets if it has to. 
after Katrina, we went from this hospital and, and went down to get the cats. And, and many, after even a couple of weeks out, were, you know, catching birds and, and, and not coping great, but coping where a dog couldn't have done that. Domestic cats, such as your house pet, can very easily revert back to a wild nature. So within one generation, they really can become a feral cat and survive quite well on their own. That's what's rather unique about cats. These feral cats' ancestors may have been pets that ended up living on the streets. Generations down the line, they have a unique lifestyle. Watching them, it's possible to get a glimpse of what it might have been like thousands of years ago when cats first began loitering around human settlements. Wherever domestic cats live together, they develop a group identity and a hierarchy just like lions. It's smelling like the rest of the gang that's really important. Grooming isn't just about cleanliness. It spreads the smell around. And it's the same for house cats. So cats will groom each other. The action itself brings about closeness and bonding with cats, but it also creates this group scent, and cats primarily rely on scent. So if everyone smells similar, they're all going to feel like they're of one group. They'll feel more affiliated and friendly. So the next time your cat seems to be grooming you, it doesn't necessarily mean it thinks you need a bath. It may be a way of saying it sees you as part of its extended family. Among cats, scent is key. Throughout their lives, it's essential that cats know which odors are good and which are not. Scent that lets a male know when a female is in heat, good. Scent that says, I'm a member of your tribe, good. Scent that announces, here I am, this is where my toilet is, this is where I eat. Not so good. So the survival instinct that is related to this covering behavior of their stooling and urination in the, the litter box is to make sure that the scent is not attracting predator or competitor cats to the area. The same goes for food. Cats generally belong to the clean plate club. But if there are leftovers, they do their best to hide the scent. The cat-human relationship seems like a win-win. We get the companionship of a gorgeous pet. They get safety, room, and board. But the arrangement has been very much on our terms. A stray alley cat is very different than the pampered Persian who lives on the 13th floor like a cliff dweller with, with, with his people. His feet maybe never even touch the ground. He's never been outside in his life. cats in captivity, these domestic house cats, they don't really have a chance always to exhibit their catness. If you ask the cat what his ideal daily regimen would be, the daily activities, it wouldn't be what he does living with us, so there's been a compromise. Kevin Fitzgerald has been an animal vet for 30 years. And even in that short time, he's seen things change. What we see with cats now is, is that cats are living longer with better nutrition and better care. And so it's become an age-specific type of medicine. Whereas veterinary medicine for cats used to be focused primarily on the kitten and getting him spayed and neutered and getting his shots, now we're starting to see geriatric things, diabetes, cataracts, arthritis, heart disease, kidney failure. You're not going to do anything scary today. You sit on my lap, okay? And just calm down. I can listen to your heart. Frank is a regular. He has a heart condition and needs to be treated with care. Any stress could be dangerous for him. He sure got jazzed up. Yeah. The problem with cats is they hate the doctor's office. It's they weird do. here. He's lost a little weight. It's which... always good to lose a little weight. Yeah. The problem is with cats is we've taken a hundred and stalker jumper species and turn them into couch potatoes. If you, if you look at wild species, we used to laugh when I was in vet school and say, there aren't any fat lions. 
But if you had to chase down everything you ate, you'd be lean too. One of the biggest problems I see would be obesity. I'm not at all certain that cats were meant to eat as frequently, as much, as, as often as we do. Because that's such a problem with the American public with people. And so I think it's kind of one for me, one for you. And it's difficult to tell a 350 pound man that his cat's overweight. When we brought the cat into our world, we gave it a lifestyle that was bound to be dangerous to its health. And in our fascination with creating the perfect cat, we've used genetics to change physical features and have even developed new breeds. Blue Lynx Point Himalayan. When God gave out noses, she was in the wrong line. She huh? was. <laughs> she was but cute noses and other bred-in features can cause problems. Right now, if you look at a the Persian, they have a very pleasant expression. They have like a little tiny nose, big eyes, little ears. And it's a, natu it's a natural mutation, which means that they're bred like this and born like that. <laughs> If we're just breeding for a beautiful coat, we're only paying attention to, you know, is that tail long enough? You know, if we only look at the physical beauty, sometimes health issues will arise. When we look at some of the flat dish face breeds with eye problems and, and you know, problems with breathing, abbreviating the nose, uh, elongating the soft palate, uh, you know, collapsing tracheas. It's not how nature planned it. They have a, a button nose. <laughs> In the most extreme cases, our taste for the distinctive and exclusive has created animals that will never be able to respond to the call of the wild. We're kind of developing our designer kitties, but they certainly look far from what a cat looked like 100 years ago. Come on, sit with mommy. Sit with mommy and me. April Argon breeds perhaps the most bizarre looking of all domestic cats, the naked and short-legged Bambino. For some people, you know, it may seem a little extreme to have, you know, two different genes and mutations and things going on. But April has been devoted to these strange looking cats ever since she had her first Bambino. It was just the most adorable thing when she was pregnant because she had her short legs and for the last two weeks of her pregnancy, her belly would actually graze the bottom of the floor. And so we would have to put a sweater on her because I felt bad with her belly touching the cold tile. <laughs> Sometimes with these very, very uh, specific looks and, and these really extreme looks on these breeds, to get that, we, we have to have very directed and selective breeding. But we also may lock in free riders unwittingly. We lock in deleterious genes that we didn't mean to. April understands the problems involved in this kind of breeding. Our male cats are the Bambinos, so the short-legged gene, and all of our females are the regular Sphinx with the long-legged gene because the short-legged gene for the Bambinos is a dominant gene, and if two kittens were to result and get the dominant gene, then it would be lethal, and so we're not comfortable doing it that way. This painstaking breeding makes the Bambinos the ultimate house pet. I don't believe that these cats would ever survive outside on their own. They are too fragile and they don't know to be afraid of danger. And because they don't have any fur, they wouldn't be able to keep themselves warm during a cold night or cool themselves during a hot day. So it would not be a good situation for them. New breeds like the Bambino are totally reliant on us. They couldn't catch their dinner if their lives depended on it, which it would. It's the cat's adaptability to our way of life that's made them such good companions. Why is the cat so successful? Because it can take food straight off a plate. Look at what they've got, sharp claws and fangs. They should be hunting. But the fact that they're capable of being flexible enables them to be survivors. They've spent the last 10,000 years by our sides without sacrificing their true selves. For me, what makes a cat a cat is the lion in that little body. A cat can make it on their own. My chihuahua <laughs> would be lost and end up somebody else's dinner very quickly. But these guys, they're still so much closer to what they were meant to do, to be cats.